welcome to whatever this channel is. I'm going to be covering games mostly, but also whatever else suits my fancy because hey, screw it. It's my channel after all. At a loss for what to start at, I decided I'd do some tiny games on itch.io I had lying around my hard drive. First up is Our Lady of Sorrow, a first person spooky PS1 inspired found footage horror game by developer Tooth and Claw, though in game they'd go by Dan McGrath I guess. In this game you walk slowly, sometimes you pick up keys and a couple other doodads, and other times you do stuff with them like unlock doors and play sing, you know, Resident Evil stuff. Not gonna lie, having played so many of these HIOs over the years, I'm pretty over the indie PS1 retro revival thing spearheaded by games like Anatomy and Paratopic. But what are you gonna do? After all, Unity PS1 shaders are easy enough to get a hand on, and everyone's got that one VHS font lying around somehow. Anyways, you've got witness style morose downtrodden statues, whooshy screen space shaders making the viewport all trippy dippy. That problem every indie first person game made in Unity has where because it's first person script defaults to get access instead of get access raw, your camera can't stop on a dime once you let up on WAS, as well as tons of VHS static that kinda goes on too long. Lots of distorted audio. That's the morsels of story we get that are the main draw here. We open with a VHS blue signal screen with text that reads, This tape and its contents are the property of the diocese of... with a cross hanging eerily above. Any attempt to copy, redistribute, or publicly display this tape... Hey, I can't read that. This tape must only be played under the strict supervision of members of the church. Ireland, 1998. Kinda corny intro aside, here in all Ireland 1998, it's raining and perpetually 5.36pm until scripted moments move time forward. We approach a sign giving us big lore about what it calls Kilcree Abbey, though a quick internet search reveals it to actually be called Kilcrea Friary, spelled slightly differently. Maybe the developer was intentionally trying to change details around to give the whole thing more of a fictional bend. Like, a couple articles I found about the actual Freire says it was founded in 1465, while the game says 1458. Dan McGrath is based in Cork, Ireland, according to a tweet he retweeted, which is close by Kilcrea Abbey, so I think this is a case of playing fast and loose with the details to horrific effect. Anyway, the sign says that Kilcree Abbey has served as the center of a series of calamities, and that most famously priests and nuns were known to perish there. The Abbey is home to many tales and myths from across the centuries. Stories of ancient monks stowed away beneath the mossy stone, buried in prayer. Stories of sieges and bloodshed of the Irish at the hands of English nobles. The most famous story of all is the story of Ankaich, known to locals as the Lady of Sorrow. Now if you didn't know, the Lady of Sorrow, usually referred to as Our Lady of Sorrows, is the Biblical Mary. And if you don't know who that is, well, according to the New Testament, as a virgin she gave birth to some little boy named Jesus Christ in Bethlehem after the angel Gabriel told her that she would in Nazareth. In the game, the Lady of Sorrow story is apocryphal, but a common through line is that she was a witch burnt alive by the followers of a priest she cursed. Her face was a weeping Virgin Mary, but then consumed by more than just fire, she started to laugh. When all said and done, the priest has her smoldering body thrown in the well, and the entrance sealed. And that's the setup. You're left to your own devices to figure out what to do, you spend some time wallowing around the darkness for a while, Remember that you have a flashlight on right click, and then actually have some actionable way forward. So yeah, I grew up Catholic, but I have a weird relationship with the religion. See, I went through the catechism process, I got confirmed, baptized, reconciled, the whole kit and caboodle, yet I don't know that I ever thought about it as something more than a bunch of practices and stories I had to learn because I was supposed to. Like when you had to read Animal Farm in middle school, or Age of Innocence in high school. 
Stories of ancient monks stowed away beneath the mossy stone, buried in prayer. Speaking of high school, by then I had definitely washed myself of the very concept of religion. Yeah, I was one of those burning hard atheists that had to make sure that any and every person I knew knew that I was maybe right, but that they were most definitely wrong. But these days, I don't really know. Or rather, I guess I think that I know that everyone's wrong, because how could anyone know death when whatever happens, happens, you know? Yeah, but Our Lady of Sorrow isn't much that kind of story. There's no coming to terms with what religion means. This is really just a sp uh, religion is spooky, isn't it, kind of story. Eventually you get access to the well, the priest threw her remains down, only to discover that, shocker, she's still alive down there, and also, she's pretty much the only animated thing you'll see in this game, unless you count statues moving when you're not looking at them, a la a trillion other horror games of this one's ilk. And like a lot of other games of its ilk, the game's lugubrious walking speed makes getting lost feel like a punishment, because returning to a vantage point with decent visibility takes very long. I don't know, I wanted to like this one more than I did. The atmosphere is defo neat, there's some nice sound design, good treesway, and yeah, it's a short, silent, hilly PS1 game, if something like that's what you're after. But like a lot of these, I felt like the experience just didn't go anywhere super interesting. You don't really learn enough to want to do any research outside of the game, which my favorite kinds of games are ones where you kind of feel motivated to take action beyond the game itself. It's like those games have sort of enriched your life in a real tangible way. Yeah, there's really not much of a story here to write home about at all. Structurally, this thing is doubly pretty lacking. Nothing much of interest happens until you open the well, but once you go down, it's just a lot of boring tunnels with more statues and candles. Especially with the game climaxing at a pretty cruddy jump scare. Spooky, the footage is haunted. And then you get a fourth wall breaking. You're playing a game? Huh? Look, not to be too hard on the developer, but come on now, really? Okay. I promise my shtick with this channel is not going to be be mean to indie developers making slightly creepy games about Christian deities. But in my defense, I did not know the interview would be about that when I started playing it. So, the interview. This is a game by Tyrobite where you're another floating camcorder, I mean Detective Brian Moore, walking down a jail hallway full of, and I quote, twats, who are in for some serious shit and being led by one Officer Paul toward an interrogation room, where said interview will commence. He mentions that who we're here to speak with is tricky, and it's pretty good foreshadowing, I guess, and we open the door to reveal the second part of the game, the interview, with this thing, Sister Maria. I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a reference to Sister Maria Crocifissa della Consangione, a mentally ill nun who in 1676 failed to show up to her scheduled choir and was later found by her convent in her cell with ink on her face and a letter she apparently was possessed to write in magical writing by Lucifer himself. Either way, that story doesn't have much relevance here because our focus is a demon thing with a floating eyeball above it. The game basically turns into a visual novel from here on out. You talk to Sister Maria and answer her questions through dialogue choices. So instead of interviewing her, it turns out you're kind of being interviewed by her. Sister Maria claims to be a vessel of God sent to cleanse the world of sin on his behalf. She knows about Detective Brian's dead wife and is willing to use that knowledge to get under his skin if you as the player make dialogue choices for Brian that question God's existence and will. Like Our Lady of Sorrow, the interview walks toward the entryway of religion where the sign says, isn't this God stuff scary? But it doesn't really go anywhere else. It's a similarly satisfying experience that doesn't seem to understand what makes good horror effective the act of unearthing what's always existed beneath the surface. Yeah, there's two endings here, but I didn't feel particularly compelled to get the other on my own, and I'm glad I didn't because I ended up looking it up online, and while it is more substantive than the one I got in terms of unique content, it's similarly lacking depth. 
Next. Tripling up on the first person walking around games here. Apartment is by Kananiko Quigley with music and sound design by Maisie Wallen, which was commissioned for the Free Play 2021 Independent Game Festival in Melbourne. Heads up, this one might be a bit depressing or even triggering if you struggle to talk about what it was like going through the pandemic. In the initial days, that is. So, yeah, it's pandemic art. You play somebody who's returning to an old apartment, having lived with their family for some time as a result of the pandemic. You're here to pack your stuff. The pandemic has ruined the need for this old place. As you explore the apartment, you can click on objects out and about, hidden in cupboards and drawers, under your bed, in the closet, and so on. Some of it you take with, others you decide to leave behind. The pandemic has ruined the need for them. The pandemic. We're all tired of hearing about it, but it doesn't matter how many times you've been jabbed with vaccine goody goods, the reality is that somebody you know probably hasn't or someone they know, and so on. So yes, I get not wanting to play something like this. The wound is still raw after all. But I think Apartment is actually a really worthwhile experience. Visually, it has that one bit look that you got in a lot of old school Macintosh games, though a lot of people today might associate that aesthetic with Lucas Pope's Return of the Open Den, which is actually directly referenced in the game. Anyway, it's fun ruffling through and looking at the player characters' myriad doodads and knickknacks, especially if you enjoy looking for frog detective easter eggs in indie games. The way the plucked strings twinkle in and out of your perception it reminds me a lot of the programmatic music of David Kanaga. The not great credit song notwithstanding, here is really wonderful. So is the sound design. It's so crisp and pairs really nicely with the sparse yet colorful animation work. Every time you click an object, you become more grounded in this abstraction of an apartment. That tension between abstraction and verisimilitude is enough to make apartment compelling, even when the writing isn't doing enough to hold up its end of the bargain. For every interesting anecdote about how an unusual gift of hand soap became an unintentional lifesaver, or how handy it was to have extra toilet paper after it became such a precious commodity, I got bored of countless generic lines like, I took this with me. I didn't take this with me. A birthday gift. Look, I get that maybe you wouldn't have anything interesting to say about every loose pencil or trash can, but having these personal anecdotes deployed at all creates an expectation that most, if not all, of the objects should have little story memories associated with them. When so many don't, it can be kind of boring to click on each and every object in the entire apartment. That said, I guess it is kind of satisfying to watch stuff disappear in thin air, and the game only lasts around 20 minutes or so. I won't show it here, but the ending is kind of beautiful, and almost a little profound, so I definitely recommend checking out Apartment. Okay, enough sad up in my feelings games because I'm gaming in first person stuff. Yeah, that's more like it. Station Street is a game by Olivia Hines and Andrew Brophy, and like Apartment, it's another Free Play 2021 series commission, where Apartment needed useless trifles like walking to let you revel in its world, Station Street cuts out the middleman and gives us some good old pointing and clicking. The HIO page calls it an homage to country Victoria, where players experience a day in the life of a country town from the perspective of its residents and the roles they play. And that's not wrong, but I wouldn't necessarily characterize the game that way. So backing up, Station Street is essentially a collection of mini games that you access by pointing and clicking your way through a map. And it's gorgeous and vibrant, with some backgrounds almost looking as if a PS1 JRPG were able to use pre-rendered backgrounds as a stylistic choice instead of as a technical necessity, so there's far less compression. Except instead of high fantasy castles in futuristic places, 
Everything has this child's play place look and feel. It kind of reminds me of Final Fantasy VII's Gold Saucer and Chocobo Racing minigame. Now, I don't know if these backgrounds are pre-rendered or products of 2D art design, but either way, the game is beautiful, and the music's really nice too. It's got this vapor av 10 tricks point never type beat. Yeah, it's all just pleasant. You're given a to-do list with seven tasks, but there's no time limit, there's no huge sense of urgency. You just have four mini games to play, which are pretty cool. I won't spoil them here, but I will say that I enjoyed all of them, uh, except for a version of a certain game you play with your hands that I did not love. Otherwise, this is mostly just about exploring a small town. You shouldn't come here expecting super quirky characters that you're going to want to draw fan art of or anything resembling a narrative. You get a setup that dares to ask, what is everyone up to on Station Street? And once you complete all the tasks, the game pretty much just ends. You know what happened to everyone on Station Street. So anyway, if you want something chill and charming, I recommend this one. It's probably my favorite of the four I've covered up until this point. However, it is not my favorite in this video. Okay, so this one needs a bit of a disclaimer. I somehow did not realize that this game is by an Israeli developer, or that the song it centers around is by an Israeli band until I sat down to write this segment. This matters because, as you probably know, there's this whole boycott divestment sanctions thing that's been going on for years now in response to the Israeli Defense Force and the Israeli government's ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Venus Looks for Jupiter is a game by Dancing NG. I looked through their Twitter account and did not find any indication that this developer is against the atrocities their government commits, which does not inherently mean that they support these atrocities, um, and I don't necessarily know how much, if at all, the Israeli government controls what the Israeli people are able to safely say against their government in public forums, so you know, do with all that as you will. Anyway, all that said, for those reasons, I'm not going to make a big to-do about this game because I don't feel comfortable doing so. However, it is free, so if you do decide to play it, it's not as if your money is going anywhere foul. The developer describes Venus Look for Jupiter as a short first-person parkour game about searching for love high and low, and also shooting red objects with a big fat revolver. Think Mirror's Edge crossed with Titanfall 2 with the art style of Killer7. And it's... It is that. Uh, it's very short. I think the game is fantastic, but, you know, I... Look. God, what a world. Well, now that the wind has been sucked out of this video, I'll end on this. This video probably did not seem to have much of a thesis or coherent through line or reason to exist. But broadly speaking, I think what I'm interested in doing with this channel is to highlight games that, you know, maybe don't get the chance in the spotlight like your Elden Rings and Horizon Forbidden Wests and Destinies and even more high profile indies like Undertale or Disco Elysium. Or even something like Franken, which I was gonna cover in this video to nab some of that residual video game donkey clout, but then I kinda didn't like it very much. Now, that doesn't mean I'll never cover well-known games. I'm definitely interested in looking at the dark horses of the world, you know, the red-headed stepchildren, etc, etc. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I don't think the world needs another Why Breath of the Wild is Good Part 37 video essay, you know? I want to use this channel to help broaden people's horizons of what kinds of games are out there and broaden their horizons about what games are fundamentally, what they can be. I hope you'll take the plunge with me going forward. Finally, I'd like to thank my patrons for their support. It's your financial contributions that make this channel possible at all, so thank you. 